SCP-8001 The Edge of the World To the average explorer for the past few thousand years, the Earth was essentially limitless. No one had any clear picture of the whole planet and its many wonders, and maps were few and far between. As time pressed on, more and more of the map began to be filled in, and the world got a bit smaller each time, less filled with the unknown. This concept is practically foreign to us in the modern day, the idea that there are places in the world that we're unaware of, and we're well aware of the totality of planet Earth. SCP-8001 is about this concept, to a degree, and about explorers and stories. Let's take a look. SCP-8001 is, as the title suggests, the edge of the planet Earth. The origin of this edge, whether geological, geographical, or ontological, is unknown, and its existence despite the verified spherical shape of the planet is the primary academic goal of researchers assigned to the project. Unlike many similar anomalies, 8001 is not an extra-dimensional space or pocket dimension, and people stationed there can be detected by GPS, can make telephone calls via satellite, and can launch rockets or flares that are visible to people at remote distances. It exists as a sheer edge running along the southern Pacific Ocean, over which the waters of the Pacific flow freely into an indeterminably deep void beyond. This means that any ships approaching the area can easily be caught in the rapidly moving water and be swept over the edge. This can be prevented by following a carefully charted path that maneuvers them past a series of shoals that break up the flow of water, allowing them to reach the island of Last Watch. This passage can also be made in reverse, allowing vessels to leave safely as well. 8001 creates a substantial amount of water vapor, obscuring the area from outside observation, so it's unknown how far this edge extends in either direction. Any attempts to explore by ship inevitably results in the ship being swept over the edge, and any attempts to search by air will end with the vessel becoming lost or vision being obscured by the vapor. The island of Last Watch is roughly 1.2 square kilometers in area, with the easternmost section containing a small bay surrounded by shoals. A narrow staircase cut into the rock here leads up to the rest of the island. At the center and north of the island is a mostly flat, wooded section, upon which a variety of different kinds of trees, grasses, and brush grow, hailing from multiple different continents. To the south is a small rocky hill that serves as a graveyard, and to the west is a narrow outcropping of rock that hangs over the edge of 8001. There's a robust wooden walkway protruding out over this outcrop, allowing individuals to pass over the edge of 8001 without falling. In the flat wooded area is the Tower of Sunset, a moderately sized stone structure built in many conflicting architectural styles, likely over the course of hundreds or thousands of years. The primary exterior is built in the ancient Roman Ionic style, with limestone pillars supporting a triangular pediment, extending back into a mostly rectangular inner cella that has been added onto on all sides. There are examples of 17th century Spanish and 5th century Chinese influences, as well as more modern architecture dating as late as the early 19th century, with some fixtures being identified as originating from Britain, the US, France, and the Netherlands. The tower itself, also seemingly the oldest part, is constructed in a mixture of Greek, Egyptian, Roman, and Mesoamerican styles. The tower serves two purposes, one being as an oil lamp and reflector lighthouse, maintained by an 18th century automatic relighting system. This system appears to have been retrofitted at some point with more modern bearings and timing elements. The second purpose is that of a library, with most of the tower and the small basement levels serving as an information repository for texts and writings, seemingly collected over several hundred years of exploration. 
There are journals, logs, charts, maps, diaries, and other texts in a wide variety of languages, including Latin, French, Greek, Farsi, English, German, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Korean, Urdu, Portuguese, Americ, and many others, including pictographic languages. The collection also contains a single piece of modern digital storage, an early Sony MP3 player manufactured in 2002 with a watertight case, which is believed to have washed up on the island entirely by chance. I guess not even the edge of the world can avoid plastic waste. Despite the case, the player was damaged in the process and is no longer operable. A significant amount of technology has been fitted into the original structure over the years in order to reduce the effects of moisture, light, and aging on the texts in the library. Many of the texts have also been transliterated from their original sources into newer, more resilient articles, but there are also many that have decayed past the point of legibility. The oldest known piece of writing is a set of Egyptian tablets dating back to around 2300 BCE, which are worn down past the point of legibility, only being preserved as a reference point. The most recent document prior to the Foundation's discovery of the island in 1944 was a Chinese sea chart believed to be from 1925, altered significantly in an apparent attempt by the owner to make sense of 8001, and to attempt to chart a path away from it. Prior to the Foundation's arrival, the island had a single inhabitant, a sentient mechanical construct who maintained both the library and the lighthouse, as well as being a general caretaker of the island grounds. This entity self-identifies as Orly, and claimed to be the reconstituted sapience of a 16th century French explorer, who had been marooned on the island at some point in the past. Orly is a clockwork entity, whose locomotion and speech are controlled by a complex series of gears, diaphragms, pistons, and pulleys, all designed to mimic human behavior. The existence of an edge to the world had been thoroughly debunked throughout most of human history, with early Greeks having conceptualized a spherical earth as early as the 5th century BCE, and the acceptance of this fact becoming more widespread from there. Despite this, there have been numerous fringe groups throughout history that have claimed the existence of the world as a flat plane, with an edge running around its exterior. The first known exploration to find this edge is believed to be the ancient Roman sailor Faust Strabo, who set sail in 45 CE, but ended up marooned near modern-day Casablanca, as his vessel was unsuitable for blue water travel. There are, however, numerous instances of writing related to the edge of the earth in the historical record, such as a Chinese writer in the 4th century describing an account of fishing vessels and their crews, who were blown off course by a storm and found themselves adrift in calm waters amidst a roaring tempest at the place where the world ends. A 13th century account of an Indian vessel being lost in the high seas makes note of a terrible sound in the deep sea as if the ocean itself were spilling over, and great sheets of white foam fell from the sky onto us. None of these accounts describe the island or the structures on it, but these are perhaps the first accounts of individuals who approached the edge and managed to return. It's likely that there were many more vessels who approached and either did not leave a written record of their return, were unable to leave, or most likely attempted to reach the island or leave it, and were sent over the edge. The Foundation caught on to the potential existence of the location thanks to a manuscript discovered during a series of arranged document transfers with the Horizon Initiative. The document was a detailed sea chart by Russian engineer and seafarer Boris Kozlov, who died in 1903 and it contained an extensive description of the nature of the edge, including a depiction of the tower. The heading of the note explains that it's a map of and possible additional routes to the long line at the end of the earth and the tall tower that rests there. By way of a bright light, it gives warning to vessels in their approach to a catastrophic end which, by passing beyond, offers no hope of life or continuance of any kind. 
Of course, due to the presumed remote location and logical impossibility of 8001, no action was taken to seek it out, and the chart was held in storage. Then, in 1942, a Foundation vessel sailing between Panama and New Zealand passed close enough to 8001 to see a lighthouse, where no land is charted and no abnormality is known to exist. The Foundation subsequently investigated, but found no sign of land until the team in charge rediscovered the Kozlov chart in storage, and used it as a rough guide to make the first confirmed, intended sighting of the tower, in October of 1943. Early the following year, two additional voyages were undertaken to attempt to reach 8001, the first of which lost contact with a radio station in French Polynesia and was never heard from again, presumably caught in a storm and capsized. The second expedition, led by Captain Errol Meyer, managed to find the passageway through the shoals and landed at the island of Last Watch. Captain Meyer, with a contingent of researchers, made initial contact with Orly, who was waiting for the team near the small dock. Orly was described by Meyer as a peculiar contraption, possessing unmistakably mechanical features, yet resembling a human figure in a curious manner. It wears a modest gown and drab cloak, and boasts a slender frame of admirable craftsmanship and aesthetic appeal. One could easily mistake its silhouette for a woman, save for the moment it engages in conversation, dispelling any such illusion. Though its physical construction is a marvel of engineering, its method of articulation appears antiquated by contemporary standards. Its speech is tinged with a discernible French inflection, and it's articulate and confident, bearing no resemblance to the mechanical mimicry of human speech. An interview was conducted with Orly by Dr. Mann, with him initially explaining to Orly the machine that they're using that can capture their speech. He shows them the magnetic film and plays some of their speech back, delighting Orly in the process. With the interview beginning properly, Orly explains that this machine was built long before they arrived, with the original engineer being Italian, they believe. It was kept in storage below when they and their partner Armand arrived here, and they spent some time working to complete it. They came here like many others do, by accident, but they and Armand decided to stay here instead of risking leaving like their shipmates did. They have watched this tower for hundreds of years, and all but a handful of vessels are caught in the rush of the falls and go over. The original builders of the tower didn't seem to recognize their folly, as this may be the only lighthouse in the world where the danger is anywhere but directly towards it. Mann asks them how they ended up like this then, to which Orly says that their memory of the time before they became like this is limited. They know that they were wounded once, shortly after their arrival here, and the former keeper of this place, a man named Oladapo, suggested that they become as they are now upon the termination of their previous form. They really don't remember much from that time, however, and the early incarnation of this form was incomplete, so it took them and Armand quite some time to finish it. Man asks about the former keeper, asking if someone was here when they landed. Orly replies that it's their understanding that there has always been someone here in one way or another. There are records here going back several thousand years, and alongside them have been the notes and journals of those who were tasked with keeping those records safe. By their count, there have been 63 such keepers here, though it's possible that there were others who were here before there were records kept. Man asks if they know where the name Island of Last Watch came from to which Orly says that the oldest text here naming the place that was from a man named Jason, who called it the last watch before the end. His gravestone was marked with the words, Jason of Iolcus, tender of the last watch, although now only the last three words are legible. Those who arrived afterwards seem to believe that the stone was a nameplate for the island itself. 
As for the Tower of Sunset, it was first identified that way in an architectural drawing of the northern portico, likely due to an etching of a setting sun that was present in the original tower that faced in that same direction. Man asks who originally built the tower, to which Orly says that they don't know, as the tower predates even the oldest written record here by at least many hundreds of years. The first text here that references it says that it was built upon the very foundation of the world, a spire that rises through time itself, ancient and extraordinary. The hand that penned that line left this world more than 2,000 years ago. The Foundation began going through all of the records stored here, with the assistance of Orly, and were provided a number of them that reference 8001. From the 14th century journal of Eduardo Genovese, he describes it as a sight of great profundity to behold the waves of the vast ocean surging downward into the heavens. Gazing intently into the mist, one discerns somber silhouettes, perhaps stones or vessels ensnared below, yet to plummet into the abyss. The sensation that grips the soul whilst standing upon this precipice is naught but a communion between mortal and the divine. Such an overpowering apprehension of ultimate fate could only be ordained by the hand of God. From a 4th century text, likely Byzantine, the writer states that this locale stands as the vestibule to the celestial realm beyond our earthly abode, for hither lies the limit where mortal feet may not tread. The splendor that graces this hallowed ground suffices as testament to its verity. From a journal written by entrepreneur and explorer John Rousset, he writes that on this day, the 5th of August, 1626, the hour of man's ascendancy hath arrived. Lo, we have accomplished the craft of aerial conveyance, a marvel to behold. The fabric unfurls beneath the radiant beams of dawn, whilst His Majesty's ensign dances aloft in the breeze. Yea, this day heralds our ascent into the heavens, to venture unto those far-off realms that lie beyond the confines of our terrestrial sphere, realms hitherto untrodden by mortal foot, and from whence few have returned. Verily, the mechanical contrivance, in its semblance of sentience, hath voiced its dissent against our enterprise. Yet let it be known henceforth that the apprehensions of the Gauls shall not today dissuade the steadfast resolve of the noble progeny of England. Another document, transliterated from its original text, reads, Before us, the earth seemed to fall away into nothingness, a sheer drop into oblivion that stretched as far as the eye could see. The horizon, once a distant promise of new horizons and uncharted territories, now marked the boundary between existence and the great unknown. Of course, when dealing with hard-to-reach places and odd pieces of history, there's really only one individual to consult with, and that's noted explorer, naturalist, and conqueror of uncharted realms, Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood. One of his journal excerpts was found in the tower, which displays the characteristic bravado of its author up until he and his team found SCP-8001. Thereafter, the writing becomes noticeably concise and abbreviated, describing how his team surveyed the island, briefly spoke to the clever automaton masquerading as a Parisian who attends diligently to the illumination of the lighthouse, before saying a prayer and departing to the east. The text of the journal was found to be so out of character for Blackwood that Dr. Mann sought a meeting with him to discuss it, as he is currently contained at Site-19 as SCP-1867. Blackwood is glad to have someone to talk to, and remarks how sailing the high seas was a favorite activity of his in his youth. Mann mentions that they found a journal that they hadn't seen before, and they believe he hasn't mentioned before. 
Blackwood is surprised, as he feels that he's been quite thorough in his examination of his past affairs with the Foundation, so he can't imagine what he may have missed. Man provides him with a transcription of the text, and Blackwood recognizes it, stating that it was written by him. Man mentions the irregularities in the tone, and asks if another individual wrote the later sections, but Blackwood says that it was penned by him. He pauses, and says that there's no dark revelation here, if that's what they're expecting. Man replies that they just found it peculiar, that he found the literal edge of the world, and only wrote a handful of paragraphs describing it. Blackwood asks if he was expecting something more, to which Man admits that he was, and Blackwood states that so was he. The expedition that led them there was fraught with danger at every turn, with fierce tempests, a fearsome kraken, assaults from both pirates and mutineers. They sought the very brink of existence, and then there it was. They had reached the edge, and there was no further to go. Man doesn't understand, as he discovered something that shouldn't exist and managed to return from it. In all his many tales, all the incredible things he claims to have seen and experienced, what could possibly be more monumental than this? Blackwood replies that that's the crux of the matter. There was perpetually another adventure awaiting, another creature to vanquish, another maiden to rescue, or a foreign regime to topple. His existence has been one of myriad distant horizons, and in his fervent pursuit of them, he has witnessed and accomplished remarkable feats. The instant he perched upon that rock, however, and gazed into the veiled expanse beyond, he sensed nothing but emptiness. That place is the last horizon, and there are none beyond it, not for him or for anyone else. It is the edge of the map, a place they cannot pass beyond, and there are no more stories to be told there. He admits that he did experience one profound feeling when he saw that place. He realized that the world is not nearly as big as he had once dreamt it to be. Next were provided an excerpt from one of the Tower Keeper's journals, Adan Sedano, which reads... That morning I descended from the tower as the rays of the sun stretched their golden fingers across the island, casting long shadows that danced upon the edges of the tower's walls. There, beneath the shade of the ancient rosewoods, sat the aged watchman, his gaze fixed upon the distant western sky. His countenance, weathered by the years of solitary toil in the care of our archives, bore a rare tranquility as I approached to offer my aid for the day's tasks, and perhaps a tome to occupy his leisure. It is his smile that lingers most vividly in my memory, a serene expression that had eluded him for many a season. The passage of time had etched deep furrows upon his visage, yet on that morn his gruff demeanor gave way to a moment of geniality as he bid me join him in silent contemplation, the morning light shimmering upon the drops of water. Inquiring after my youth, he sought tales of my past life in the Holy Land, of my lineage and upbringing. Recollections of distant memories stirred within me as I recounted my aspirations of exploration and worldly discovery, while he in turn recounted his own past endeavors and aspirations. Once, he confessed, I harbored dreams of following in my father's footsteps as a carpenter, a shipwright, yet fate had other designs. In the ensuing discourse, he regaled me with tales of his travels, his loves, his fears, and the myriad wonders and oddities encountered in his journeys across distant lands. Enthralled, I listened intently as he spun his tales into the weft of time. As twilight draped its cloak upon the world, he turned to me with a gaze brimming with fervent resolve, as though seeking answers within my very soul. He spoke of the enigmatic nature of our abode, 
where countless odysseys had reached their terminus, their mysteries left unresolved. In a voice weighted with solemnity, he posed a question that lingered in the air like the echoes of a forgotten lament. What worth, he asked, did such answers hold for a man? What worth did they hold for me? Bereft of an adequate response, I could only ponder his words in silence. That night, he bestowed upon me his cherished journal, bidding me to add it to our repository come the morrow. Tomorrow, he declared, let it join the annals of our record. I fear I have naught more to impart. Come the dawn, I awoke to find him gone leaving behind naught but folded robes and sandals beneath the ancient rosewoods. His absence lingered as a silent testament to the transient nature of existence, and I never beheld his countenance again. During one of man's nine expeditions to SCP-8001 between 1944 and 1972, he spoke to Orly while transcribing his own recorded notes. Man asks them what's on their mind, to which Orly says that he has spent much time here studying the Archive, and Orly has spent much, much more time doing the same thing. They wonder what man's summation is of these texts, to see if their own analysis somehow falls short of biological humans. Man notes that it's difficult to say, as so many of them end the same way. They're either delusional and preparing to sail over the edge and to their deaths, or they're distraught about what this place is and what it means. Man asks Orly what kind of person finds a place like this, to which they respond simply with sailors generally. But man means what kind of characteristics does a person have to seek out a place like this, to see the edge of a map and desire to travel to it, Orly surmises that it would be those with an intrepid spirit, adventurers and explorers. Man agrees, as it's those who want to write stories and have their stories be known, and they aren't so different from himself. In many ways, what he's doing here is something of an adventure as well. The information they're gathering may be different, but the reason they're doing it is the same. You see a part of the map that isn't filled in, and you go there to find out what's missing. So they come here, and they find this place, and they realize that this is all it is. They can't travel any further past this point, and even now, with their modern technology, the very nature of this place is a wall beyond which the knowledge of man does not extend. All of those stories, and all those storytellers, this place is anathema to them. It's the back of the book. Orly understands, as they have often wondered about them, the ones they have met. They have spent a considerable amount of time here, but their focus has been on maintaining the tower, the library, the grounds, the graves on the hill, and tending to the trees and grasses. They admit they have not often considered the meaning of this place, or what a place like this means to those who find it. They once considered it perhaps a deficiency in the construction of the form they now inhabit, but perhaps not. Man asks them what they mean, and Orly says that they once told him about how they came to be here, and their friend Armand. In truth, before their transfiguration, they had been more than friends, and there were many years at the beginning where they were unable to move adequately, and it would be even more years until they were able to speak to him. But every day Armand would spend time with them, working on the mechanisms that keep them alive, making them more of what they had been before. At night they would sit together outside, and he would sing songs to them, songs they must have loved once, songs like from a dream. When they finally could speak, Armand helped to teach them about what they had lost. They became lost in their books, in these ancient scrolls and catalogs, and they think Armand realized then what Orly would not understand for some time after, that the time they had been granted now was significantly more than what Armand had left. Their work was feverish, but he was never unkind, 
and he would tell them how happy he was to be here with them, at the end of all things. He said that even if they could not be together forever, he was content to have had the chance to be with them now. Man asks what happened to him, to which Orly says that they cannot explain it, not truly. One day they had realized that Armand had grown old, but he was still tender and kind. They remember one day they were sitting together, speaking as they often did about how this place had ever come to exist. Armand was quiet for a time, and then told them that he did not know for certain, but he believed that there had once been many places like this in the world, parts of the map that had not been explored. All of them, he said, would eventually be filled in, but not this one. He had said it was a miracle to not know what comes next, and what greater mystery could there be than this? Orly pauses and says that he walked out past the end of the pier one night. Orly ran to him, afraid that he would fall, but he never fell. He took one step and then another, and continued to walk as the sun set in front of him. He turned back one more time before the sun slipped into the darkness below, and for just a moment, Orly could have sworn that he was young again. He smiled at them, and waved, and then he was gone. Orly pauses again, and says that maybe there is nothing beyond these falls, and maybe this really is the end of the story. There are so many who believe that to be true, but perhaps it's not the back of the book. Perhaps this is just the turning of the page, and perhaps even here, at the edge of the world, there are still stories left to be written. It's interesting to see how Blackwood, ever the optimist and adventurous spirit, saw 8001 in such a depressing light. For him, like many others, it was the end of stories, the literal edge of the world with nothing beyond, and the fact that there was an edge at all just made his world feel a little smaller. Meanwhile, Orly, an automaton that had been there for an unknown amount of time, and has seen so many crestfallen adventurers find the island and the edge, still feels that there's a chance that there's something beyond this edge. I think this article was written from this sense of vague optimism, that stories don't ever need to really end, as there's always a continuation in some form. This SCP could have taken on a much different form, if written in a different way, with the typical logs of hapless D-class and drones being sent over the edge to find out what's there. Instead, we're never given any real scientific explanation for the edge or what's beyond, as it's left up to the reader. Are you disappointed, like Blackwood, that there's nothing else here, just an infinite edge of nothingness? Or are you optimistic, that there's something beyond there, something that you may never get to know or understand, a story that continues past the final period?